Hey Internet, welcome to another episode of Mr. Ford's Guide to the A-plus Certification Exam. In this video, we're going to take a look at the CPU buses. So hey, welcome back. In this video, we're going to take a look at the buses that are part of the CPU. Now, this can get a little confusing. Uh, we're going to try to break this down as much as possible. Uh, my personal feelings on this one are some people make this more complicated than it needs to be. So we're going to just get to it, all right? The first thing I want to talk about is the internal data bus. Now, internal means inside, internal. So for example, you have internal organs. They're inside your body. It'd be very awkward if they were outside your body. So internal data bus, we're talking about something that's inside the CPU. You might also hear these being called the registers or the internal registers. What this does is it determines how much data can be moved around within the CPU at a given time. It's basically holding cells within the processor. It is its to-do list within the processor. It's its little in buckets. It's what it can work with at that point in time. Now, if we go back to our brain analogy, this would be something like short-term memory where you can only work with so many things at a time. It's like seven plus or minus two, don't worry about that. But this internal data bus, this internal register is what you can chunk around, move within the CPU at any given time. The size of the register determines how much data the CPU can work with at any given time. And uh, for example, a 32-bit internal data bus, a 32-bit internal register, can work with 32 bits at a time, while a 64-bit register can work with class, anyone? 64 bits, of course. By the way, this is also how we name our CPU. So you might hear of 32-bit computing or 64-bit computing. This is what we're talking about here. The next one I wanna talk about is something called an address bus. The address bus is a set of wires that keeps track of where things are written or read from the memory. The address bus is how the CPU keeps track of what it puts in memory. It says, you file it here, or I need this, where did it get filed, and pulls it back. So the address bus is the bookkeeper, as it were, for the CPU to get into the RAM, to get into the memory. It dictates how much RAM the CPU can work with, which kind of makes sense if the address bus is there keeping track of the RAM, the memory, then it's the address bus that determines how much memory you can have. So a 32-bit CPU can access a maximum of 64 gigabytes of RAM. Now, we never actually saw that number, mainly because of operating system limitations. But the address bus deals with how it accesses the RAM, how it gets information out of there, and where it hides it and all that good stuff. The next one is the external data bus. This is the road into and out of the CPU. It's how information gets into the CPU and how information gets out of the CPU. Now, again, go back to our, our brain analogy, okay? Your brain, okay? Apparently, it's a terrible thing to waste. Anyways, it's your brain. And your brain has information. It's processing information. So, for example, it is about 1.30 when I shot this and I kind of skip lunch, and so I'm getting a little hungry, and so my brain is going, you're getting a little hungry. Well, how do I know that? How did I know that I'm getting hungry? Well, signal, information has to come from my body. It goes through a hole in my skull into the brain. It's brought information into the brain. So let's say that I now want to get up out of the chair and go grab something to eat. Information has to go from my brain back out to my body. It goes through the spinal cord into the nerves. That's what the external database, database, data bus is. It is that pathway into and out of the CPU. Now, it's obviously not a bunch of nerves, not yet. Organic computing is something from Star Trek. But right now, it's just a collection of wires or pins. The wider the bus is, the more data that can move into and out of it faster. Most are currently 64-bit wide data buses, which brings up another issue that I want to talk about, and that is something called bandwidth. Now, bandwidth, and I pulled this definition from Wikipedia, it says that in computing, bandwidth is the bit rate 
of available or consumed information, capacity, blah, 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 blah. Basically, what we're looking at here is how much information can get into and out of something within a set period of time. How much information can get in and get out, okay? How fast can it move? And there are two determining factors when we're talking about bandwidth. And so take a look at this little picture here. And on one side, you see a speed limit. And on the other side, you see a highway. So let me explain what I'm doing here. The first thing that you can do to increase the bandwidth is increase the speed limit. Okay, picture a road and grandma's driving on the road and grandma is doing 30 in a 55 mile an hour zone with her blinker on. Well, that is a slow bandwidth, especially if it's single line traffic, okay? Everybody's moving behind grandma. She's not going fast. Bandwidth is slow. But if grandma gets off the road and now somebody else is there and they're doing the speed limit, let's say 50, 70, whatever, you more, you're moving more cars past a specific point. And so now you're increasing bandwidth. So you can increase bandwidth simply by increasing the speed of which data gets into and out of the whatever you want it to get in and out of. The next way to increase bandwidth, and then going back to the highway here, is to have more lanes. If grandma's driving on the road and grandma's doing 20 in a 50 mile an hour zone and it's one lane of traffic, everybody's going slow. But if grandma is driving on a five lane highway doing 30 miles an hour, besides possibly getting killed by a semi, she is not holding up traffic too much because there are four other lanes where cars can go by. So with bandwidth, if we have multiple lanes that information can get out of, you're also increasing how much information can come in and how much information can go out. So once again, we can increase bandwidth by increasing the speed of the data, or we can give it more lanes to move through. We also have a couple of other things to discuss real quick. We have the CPU to the chipset. There's a very fast bus that connects the CPU to the chipset, and it's known by several names. So picture this as the Autobahn. This is the very fast highway. We have uh, the different names for it. We have the front side bus. You might have heard of that one before. We have the processor side bus, and we have the CPU bus. All these are the same, the same thing, just different names for the same same thing. Okay, and if you are an AMD fan, they're only going to refer to it as the FSB or the front side bus. And the final concept I want to get across before we leave our bus is hyperthreading. What hyperthreading does is it Picture Walmart for a second, okay? Walmart, uh, you're you're shopping at Walmart and you buy some stuff and you have one lane open. Not that this ever happened to people, right? One lane open, you got to wait behind people, all right? Well, wouldn't it be nice if somebody opened up a second lane? Well, yes, yes, it would. Walmart opened more lanes. So this is what hyperthreading is, kind of, sort of. Hyperthreading enables a single CPU to accept two independent sets of instructions at the same time. And so what happens here is that you have two sets of instructions going through. You have multiple lanes now at checkout. Now, this was introduced with the Pentium 4, and then it disappeared because once we started doing multiple processors, dual processors, they were like, oh, we don't need that anymore. We have multiple processor to handle information. Well, they bring it back, baby. They have it back in core, uh, the i3, the i5, and the i7, they brought it back. Now, for hyper-threading to work, however, you have to have a few things uh, on the computer. One, you have to have a CPU that supports hyper-threading. Obviously, if it's a CPU thing, you need a CPU to support it. Two, you need a chipset that must support hyper-threading. The chipset, of course, being the um, the backbone of the computer, the um, basically the nervous system of the entire computer. The BIOS must support hyper-threading and you must have it enabled. And finally, the operating system must also support hyper-threading. And so that is a quick little briefer on the buses and the CPU. If you haven't clicked subscribe yet, please do so down there. Click subscribe, click like if you've learned anything. And good luck setting out there until our next video, which will be about the CPU speeds. Good luck studying, and we'll see you later. Bye-bye for now.